This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everybody, to Paranormal Stakeout. I'm your host, Larry Lawson, coming to you from the X-Zone Broadcast Network Southern Command Post in beautiful Vero Beach in Felsmere, Florida. And with that, uh, on this wonderful weekend, I want to take a second to wish all of my friends, family, and listeners in the good old USA a happy Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's uh, times like this, seasons like this, I really am grateful, not only for the folks here in the U.S., but my listeners all over the globe, uh, for your support, your friendship. Uh, and uh, as we begin this quest that I've uh, endeavored to take on and that is paranormal unity and uh, overall working together to come up with the answers that we all look for. And tonight, tonight we've got a gentleman with us that's uh, one of the, one of the uh, original names in this field, Mr. Richard Sennett. Richard was born in Los Angeles, California and grew up in the Thousand Oaks area of California. He later moved to Ventura, California, where he attended Ventura Community College and then Long Beach, Beach State University, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. After that, he had become a teacher with a passion for archaeology. And while on an archaeological excavation dig at an old Catholic mission, he experienced his first paranormal event when he observed the apparition of a monk. This experience started him on his interest in the paranormal world. An author of 24 books, many including Ghosts and Haunted Locations, Richard has become one of the most sought-after experts in the field of paranormal research and investigation. He has worked with some of the most influential names in the field, such as Dr. Thelma Moss, Dr. Hans Hosler, and D. Scott Rogo. A former historian for the city of Ventura, California, as well as museum administrator, Richard still writes, investigates, leads tours, lectures, and lectures on the world of the paranormal. His most recent books, uh, Ghost Hunters Hall of Fame and Divine Encounters, Stories of Angels and Ghosts, are currently out there. Richard Sennett, welcome to Paranormal Stakeout. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you with us tonight. You know, your name's been out there for a long time. How long have you been in the field, uh, approximately? Well, uh, I started in 1978, so that's close to 40 years now. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now... I, I really take note of the fact that you were a history teacher. Um, so many of us uh, have a love for history. And do you find that that love for history was an important part of your development as a paranormal researcher? Oh, yeah. In fact, it's been uh, ideal in researching haunted sites to learn their history and background. Also, uh, my background in archaeology was a great help because when I first started doing investigations there were no templates out there there was nothing to show me what to do so what i did is i took the same procedures you do in an archaeological dig you know doing mm -hmm. surveys and then collecting data and classifying all uh, artifacts of, in this case events so that systematic approach actually worked very well and has uh, helped me many times over the years in my research. Oh, and that's interesting. My background is in law enforcement, and I've been able to use that same structure to help me in my in my work in paranormal research investigation. So I, I can see exactly where you're coming from. Um, your first your first encounter kind of intrigues me. Uh, I'd like to hear a little more detail about it. You were on a a, a dig at an old Catholic mission in California, I assume, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. And, and that what was you uh, back in the summer of 1978, and I was with a team, and we were excavating at that particular site, which was San Antonio mm -hmm. Padua Mission, just south of Monterey. And what I liked about the dig was 
we actually lived at the mission with the monks that still live there. Oh, okay. And we were actually digging at 105 degree temperatures. It was pretty hot out there. Um, and I could tell hours worth of stories about all the crazy stuff that happens on a dig. But one night, I was finishing up on a project, which if you're all at all interested, it was classifying axe heads of all things. Okay. And it got me 12.30 at night. So I said, oh, I got to get up. You know, get up early the next morning so I closed the lab up I was the only one there and I walked out um, into the courtyard it's a beautiful courtyard you know big fountain and roses and gravel walkways and I was walking and I noticed off to my left a little bit of light moving the same direction I was but what in the world's that and as my eyes adjusted to the dim light in the courtyard, I saw it was a flame of a candle and it was being carried by a monk with a okay. hood and habit. Mm -hmm. Even though monks today are more apt to be seen wearing sweatshirts and Levi's <laughs> and habits and hoods. But I thought, well, maybe if it's one of the monks, one of the brothers is up, I'll go talk with him. So I changed my direction, got closer and closer to him, and I could see every detail uh, there was nothing odd or paranormal about it till I got about a 10 feet away from it, and bam, he disappeared. He vanished right there in front of my eyes. He was there one second, and he was gone the next. In fact, hmm. my first reaction was he fell like a hole. And I looked at <laughs> the hole, hmm. and then it slowly dawned on me that this must be a ghost, and that's why I got scared. I went back to my room. I couldn't sleep that night because every time I closed my eyes, I'd see it in my mm -hmm. mind's eye. You know. So the next morning I got up and we all ate together, the archaeological team and the monks in this gigantic hall. I could have seated two, three hundred people really, but there were only about 24 monks left and there was 40 of us archaeologists, so we uh, went on either end of this great hall. I went and found that we were having flapjacks for breakfast. Yeah. So I went and joined the monks. Now, they were very nice guys. You know, I sat down with them. What were they having? Steak and eggs. <laughs> so I had some steak. And I, I was I'll say, you got the short them. of the deal there. <laughs> yeah, well, they get something for being a monk, I guess. <laughs> and so I asked casually, oh, are there any stories about ghosts here and they all got quiet they all looked at me gave me this funny look and these are franciscans right right and they said we see them all the time and they gave me a litany of ghost stories all kinds of bizarre stuff including a floating ball of light and a headless horse woman who rode around the mission late at night and um i was about to leave and they said, oh, there's one story we haven't told you. Brother Joseph. So I sat back down. There had been a member of their order named Joseph, who was a really great guy. Everyone loved him. They saw him like a living saint. He mm -hmm. did extra work at the Indian Reservation. Uh, he was just this wonderful man, elderly man. And every night at 1230, he would light a candle and go from his room into the church and pray for an extra hour. He died as an elderly man. He went to his reward. He's buried there at the mission. And they'd see him, even after his death, doing that ritual at 1230 at night. Now, when they're telling me this, I start to get chills running down my spine because that's what I saw. And it was and the same exact time, wasn't it? Yep, the right time. Everything was correct. Candle, the whole bit. But here's my question. I saw this figure go halfway through that courtyard, and then all of a sudden, he disappeared. Where did he go? That's my question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I have some answers to that. I believe that ghosts can skip through time. So that was a Tuesday. He may have just jumped into Friday. Now, I can't do that. I can't follow him. So yeah. to him... I appeared to, to vanish as he went into Friday. 
uh, to me, he appeared to vanish as he left my time frame and went into this next one. Well, that's well, a, a theory. I don't know yeah, how true and, it is. And, 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 and as we get on in our conversation, I want, to, I want to explore that a little bit more with you uh, just a little bit later in the show. Uh, so that mm-hmm. began that began your 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 journey into the paranormal world. What step did you take next to to uh, continue preparing yourself for further study? Did did you? Well, when I got back from that dig. I had been a local historian since I was in high school. I thought, well, maybe I, what I'll do is I'll write a little article uh, for the paper about the ghosts of Ventura. How many could there be? I bumped into a few stories over the years, what, 25? Well, I'm still collecting stories, and now <laughs> I have nearly a thousand ghost ju- stories just, just at one town. Ventura. Just a Ventura? Yeah. Interesting. Now, cool. Well, it's probably not what you think, though, because I use the archaeological method. Those mm-hmm. are 1,000 sightings of ghosts. Many are of the same ghost. Gotcha. I have 85 uh, sightings of a ghostly woman. Ghost is just a thousand sightings of ghosts. Mm -hmm. So about that's what started. And I didn't know what I was doing. I, there weren't any books out there. There was nothing. I got to know people uh, by reading papers and, and asking friends I knew. And I got to calling and contacting the ghost hunters of that day there are only about 12 of us in the whole country and they were all very helpful and really told me what to do and where to go people like dr hans holzer mm-hmm. and richard crow over in chicago you know d scott rogo down in pasadena and dr thelma moss over at ucla all of these people book I could find on the subject. And then, as it turned out, I found myself being called to do investigations. I didn't and, even know I would just, what I was doing, you know. Here I'm just a total novice, spending the night in old haunted houses, trying to be as scientific as I could, using ar- archaeological uh, formatting as the uh-huh. basis of my ghost hunting. And uh, over the years, I've refined my technique and I've Mm -hmm. gone to hundreds upon hundreds of houses throughout California, Nevada, and Hawaii. Yeah, well, and and when we get, we're getting ready to take a break in just a minute or so. When we get back, I want to talk a little bit about your work with uh, Hans Holder and and Thelma Moss, because they they were were some of the real uh, pioneers in our field. So um, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you a little bit more more about them in just a just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, many of the things that I've I've noticed over the years, however, is uh, many many folks have um, how to put this. They 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 don't know how to investigate, and they 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 don't even receive training. They just jump jump into it. Did you find that was a very difficult thing for you, or was th- was your archaeological training really that helpful? It was very helpful, but it wasn't easy. And back in those days, being a ghost hunter was uh, not popular. And I got a lot of uh, you know, hate mail, uh-huh. people accusing me of working for Satan. Uh, uh. I got all kinds of people jokes. Oh, you study goats, you know. Oh. <laughs> and all kinds of my family suffered for it. I know my well, children were singled out at school and oh, uh, faced uh, problems because of my ghost hunting ways. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to take our break right now. When we get back, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Dr. Holtz, uh, Holzer as well as Dr. Mose, Moss and a few others. So folks, stay with us. Great conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. Paranormal State now. Do you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, 
Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And uh, welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout with my guest tonight, Richard Sennett. Uh, Richard, we were talking about the uh, how you found yourself in this field. Really fascinating stuff. And and once again, I mentioned before, I, knowing your background in history, it just solidifies my belief that the love of history and paranormal research do go hand in hand. Um, you spent, I mean, you spent some time with some of the big names. Tell me how you uh, you became in the company of Dr. Holzer and uh, uh, Dr. Moss? Well, it was very easy, you know. You just called them and asked them, or called them on the telephone. He lived in New York. I live out in California. Right. But he was very helpful and always there. In fact, when we first met, he was on a book tour here in California, and I went to his uh, hotel in Los Angeles and interviewed him for a radio show. And... Um, It was just great. In fact, the first thing he said is, how dare you call yourself a ghost hunter? I am a ghost hunter. I wrote the book, Ghost Hunter. You can't do it. I've copyrighted the name. I said, oh, really? (laughs) uh, What about Reverend Doge in the 17th century who called himself a ghost hunter? Would uh, it doesn't he have the X on that title? He invented it the hundreds of years ago. (laughs) All he did was laugh, laugh at that. He he patted me on the back and said, you know, your history and. From that moment on, we were good friends, and we shared data and information. And plus, mm-hmm. he did a lot of investigating in my neck of the woods uh, out mm-hmm. here in California, and I uh, followed in his heels and did some further follow-up of uh, places he investigated, such as the Stagecoach Inn, where he went with his uh, simple leap, the psychic mm-hmm. he used a great deal, who was right. also a witch, by the way. Wonderful English lady. Mm-hmm. Um but well, no, Hans, uh, well, Dr. Holzer himself was a Wiccan, if, if memory serves. Yeah, I don't know if he's a Wiccan. I didn't know him that carefully. I know he's a psychiatrist, and I know he was not a Christian believer in any uh, shape of the word. I know his uh, daughter, uh, Alec, uh, Alexis, is still carrying on his work, and um, I think that's really great. And I know her as well. She's a wonderful lady. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I find it interesting, too. He really did not like the gadgets that are used in paranormal investigations. He really preferred to work uh, f- with a medium rather than any type of uh, scientific equipment. I find that interesting. Well, actually, in a way, he was very 1920s. He was back when at the very roots of ghost hunting. In fact, you might even say he was almost 19th century in a lot of his uh, techniques that he used and employed. Not that they're bad, it's just that they did not rely upon instruments or gadgets. He tried to stick to impressions, stories, using uh, templates formed by other cases to reach Mm -hmm. his conclusions. Also on psychology. Remember, he was a teacher of psychology. So that played a part in his investigations. But no, he was not uh, what we would call a ghost hunter in the scientific uh, 
meme, uh, he is uh, probably far more linked to something very almost steampunk. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a w- well said, well said. Um, but I find most of his work really, really fascinating. Uh, Doctor Moss, uh, another interesting uh, sort, of, uh, did a lot of work with uh, uh, auras and whatnot. Uh, what was mm-hmm. your connection with her? Oh, I knew her for a long time. I know some of the people she trained as well, like uh, Gainer and, and uh, others that that uh, have worked out. And she, uh, I spoke with her a number of times. And by the way, she forwarded cases to me. She couldn't handle a case. She'd forward them on, and I would do the follow-up legwork of the case. It's really fascinating because though she believed in the concept of ghosts she never saw one she never had an experience with it Mm -hmm. and she was a good scientist because she would take a path and work it out to its end and many times she's ended at a dead end like Mm -hmm. her work with curly and photography yes body electric Uh, and she finally found out that went nowhere that there was nothing to curly and photography, but she followed it all the way to the end. In fact, it was her book uh, that she wrote on the unknown that mm-hmm. kind of uh, started to get me thinking in terms of a scientific background toward these uh, uh, phenomena. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she, uh, and it, it's all, it was almost her undoing at the end. Um, all of her research uh, almost hurt her more than helped her in some ways from from everything that I've read and, and the criticism she took from it. Yes. Uh, well, even Hans Solzer, he was branded the bad boy of parapsychology. Mm-hmm. And he suffered for that, too, because he didn't keep up with current trends on uh, the subject. And she right. did as well. In fact, after, uh, and, and I will curse his name, Carl Sagan, uh, <laughs> who went on a crusade to end parapsychology research at the major universities. He branded the whole thing a pseudoscience and mm-hmm. actually went out and made sure these institutions would close down their paranormal laboratories. And that's what happened to Dr. Thelma Moss. Yeah. Kicked out of UCLA. And toward the end of her life, she was researching past life regression. Mm-hmm. I, I think just to make a living more than anything else. Mm, what a shame. Let's let's switch gears a little bit. I want to get your view on a couple of things. Mm-hmm. What is, Richard, what is a ghost? What is your theory of what a ghost is? Ah, that's a $64,000 question. We don't know. It is something that's seen, I agree. felt, heard, that, but isn't there. It's something that defies logic. You can have three people enter a room. Two mm-hmm. people will see a ghost, the third see absolutely nothing. Yep. It is uh, maddening to try to put uh, uh, an actual theory in place. Now, here's a question. Do we see ghosts with our eyes or do we see them with our mind? Are they some sort of subjective hallucination or what? I mean, it is something that shouldn't be there. <clears throat> well, now, agree. there's a lot of theories about what ghosts might be. And the list is uh, huge, but, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> uh, I tend to think one that seems to work, not in all cases, but in many cases, has to do with the fabric of time. Mm-hmm. See, some people believe time is happening all at once. And sometimes, being a natural product, the barriers between the past and the present become weak. Or they're a bit like a Swiss cheese. And sometimes okay. these move in such a way that a hole appears and we can actually look back into the past and see things. Now, these are always moving. So we Dimensions. see them and then, of course, the orientation changes and they disappear because mm-hmm. the alignments are no longer there. And as we can see figures from the past, uh, we can, can also see things from the future. And there are many cases which seems to imply that that might be the case. So what you're suggesting that is is different dimensions, for, for lack of a better term. Would that be accurate? Yes, I think okay. so. Okay. 
So what you're suggesting then, ghosts really uh, could, might possibly not be uh, the spiritual energy of past past folks here on Earth, but merely though that same person walking in a different dimension, and it just crosses over. Am yeah, I, yeah, it's just a, a vision. Now, that might also account for other things, like UFOs. You look in the sky, and you see this funny bright light or disc or whoever knows what, and you think, oh, it's a UFO. It disappears again, disappearing. <clears throat> it could be that what you're seeing is an airship or a uh, vehicle from the 28th century Mm -hmm. you're looking forward in time and of course it disappears it was quite mysterious to us but of course it won't be in the 28th century Uh, just imagine a primitive man saw a helicopter flying in the sky over the forests of germany or something in the middle ages or Mm -hmm. something like that what would they think it could be that that might account for what about bigfoot that means okay. that we know there was a critter called Giganticus who walked the Earth 30,000 uh, years ago. And it was a big, hairy biped. Maybe when we see Bigfoot, all we're getting is one of these time warps after you're looking back to a time when Giganticus but, did walk. But, but like ghosts, but like ghosts, Richard, this is this is nothing more than speculation, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's speculative. Now, that does not account for all ghosts. Now, I wish I had one theory that would account for all ghosts, but it doesn't. I wish it were to make life easier, but there are ghosts that interact with the living. There are ghosts that okay. people recognize as dead loved ones. There are ghosts of uh, uh, that actually touch, feel, and change the environment. These certainly are not visions of past or present, but of something quite different. So so I don't think there's one answer for ghosts. Yeah, for for example, uh, the type of ghost we refer to as a residual, where it's just like it plays over and over again. Obviously, that can't be another dimension because it would be unless they keep coming back to that same exact moment. So, you know, it could be. So here, here's my issue with this, though. It seems like we're wanting it both ways. Um, we're, you know, it, it doesn't sound like we're coming up with an answer, but we're just throwing stuff up against the wall to see what sticks, for lack of a better that's, that's very, very true. Now, there's so many elements to ghost hunting that I find walking, it's like walking on jello. There's nothing to firmly put your your foot upon you sinking into this quagmire of uh of mystery right oh, hurt. i think that's weird what about ghosts recognized as people who were never alive and the case in point is people have seen sherlock holmes as a ghost but of course sherlock holmes didn't exist didn't people exist seeing uh huckleberry finn and tom sawyer well that do- doesn't fear- doesn't that speak to the possibility that it's the mysteries of our own mind and the lack of ah. understanding the, the strength and power of our own mind to I think you're create absolutely these things? right. Okay, there's another case. There was a house that uh, was investigated in New York. It's called the Spy House, and mm-hmm. it was haunted by a figure wearing a black cape and a black hat. And the people said it was a spy from the revolution, kind of like spy versus spy. Don't they all wear black capes and have black hats? Uh Uh Well, a guy investigated the site, and he found that the stories only go back to about 1940. Nothing before that. The house dates back to the revolution, but nothing before that about this black clad figure. He found out that the guy who rented that house was the magician um, uh, Max uh, uh, I hate it why I blank out like that. (laughs) Maxwell Grant, that was his Uh name. And Maxwell Grant was a magician but he was best known as a writer. And Mm -hmm. he wrote the character The Shadow. Uh, Ah, The Shadow So Now, he hated the Shadow. At first, he kind of liked it, well, but then he had to hey, crank out two I ha- novellas I a hate month. To do, I hate to do this to you, Richard, but we're coming up on our next break, so okay. kind of 
kind of hang on to that. We're going to get back to it in just a second. Folks, more from Richard Sennett. Stay with us. See you in a moment. The Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone broadcast network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Hey folks, welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout um, with Mr. Richard Sennett. His uh, website is richardsennett.com, author of a number of books, one of the uh, one of the old names in paranormal research and investigation. I'd also like you to uh, uh, invite you to visit my website, www.paranormalstakeout.com. Come, come on to the site and uh, uh, leave me a message. Let me know uh, what you think about the show. I'm always open to ideas and thoughts and love to hear from visit my uh, listeners. So www.paranormalstakeout.com. Uh, Richard, getting back to the, the, the commentary there, you were talking about a gentleman that had investigated a building where, where the author of The Shadow resided, yeah. correct? Um, yeah. Yeah. He, that story. Well, he grew to hate the creation, and he had to crank out these novellas. In fact, he only essentially wrote one draft and mailed it in. He would sit down at a typewriter at his uh, t- kitchen table mm-hmm. and just bat out these stories with a typewriter. And it, I believe that in that stressful moment, beating the deadline, pounding away at those typewriters till all hours, the imagery, the stress, uh, mm-hmm. somehow left him and impressed itself on the environment, the house. And mm-hmm. even though he moved away, the shadow, his creation, still haunts the place that uh, uh, he uh, so uh, uh, created him. So it could be we might be able to create our own ghosts. Well, and and that's interesting because a gentleman I have a lot of respect for, a guy named Brian Kano, uh, was doing a um, a project uh, at a conference we had here in Fellsmere, Florida a year ago. And he did that with a group of folks in a room, uh, had them think of a word as as deeply as they could, and then conducted an EVP session with the hopes of hearing that word come through on the, in the session. And a number of people actually heard that word being spoken as if it was an EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, uh, which really tended to lead credence to that theory. Maybe we create this ourselves. So I, I find that fascinating. Be. So, but it, what you're but what you're telling me is you you don't think that there's any one pat answer. You think it could be a multitude of things. That's yeah, I believe I so. There's not one answer. Oh, here's another one: theaters. Theaters are haunted. Almost uh-huh. every theater where they put on legitimate plays is haunted. In fact, I challenge people to find one that's been around a while. It's not brand new. That uh, isn't haunted. 
They all have ghosts. And from accounts of history, this dates back to Shakespeare's Globe. Now, Mm -hmm. it could be the actors put together a character, right? Mm -hmm. And on the stage, under great stress to deliver their lines, hit their marks, they put on the play, and the audience may actually contribute by their emotions and clapping. Mm -hmm. And then when the audience leaves and the actor takes off his makeup and goes away, the character they create comes back and haunts the building. So it could be that we somehow can make these things happen. So then how do we know, how do we know, and I, and, and, and I, I agree to you, with you to an extent, but how do we know that ghosts are even real then? I mean, I, I've had my own experiences. I know a number of people that also have, and it almost like, it almost sounds like we're trying to fit each situation into a, into an easy hole to explain it. Yeah, well, that's a human mind. Human mind does not like a vacuum. So Mm -hmm. if an event happens, and as a ghost hunter, you face this over and over again. A ghostly sighting takes place, and then there is a story that goes with it. People say it was this, that, or the other. And then when you do the research, you find that such events that they describe in their story never happened. Or a thing that I created, uh, I call the George Washington effect. And that is throughout uh, New England... There are inns, old inns, and establishments that are haunted by the ghost of George Washington. Mm -hmm. Now, if George Washington haunts, it would be at Mount Vernon, the place he loved, not in these little places he spent one or two nights in. But I think what happened is a ghost happened. They saw something, and this probably was the leftover remains of Hans Gruber, you know, a German who emigrated, who hung himself in the barn over Uh a lost love. But who wants to hear about Hans? Who do they want to hear about? The most famous person who stayed in that building, George Washington. So I think that phenomenon of attributing the ghost to the most famous person linked to the site, I call the George Washington effect. Okay. Well, I'm just going to ask you flat out. Do ghosts, the spirits of departed persons from this earth, are they seen and do they exist, in your opinion? Yes. And okay. that's another thing. And that's what keeps drawing up monkey wrench into my nice, clean theories, is that there are accounts of people who have seen and recognized dead loved ones and have been given information from said uh, apparitions that they couldn't have known. So there seems to be a minority of ghost sightings which are, well, true ghosts in that sense. And so well, it leaves it uh, leaves us with a lot of okay. quandaries. And, and, There's a whole lot more work needs to be done. And that's what, what I'm getting at now. What do, what do we do to reconcile this, uh, Richard? This is like all, all, all over the map, and I understand where you're coming from. But if we are going to be taken seriously in this field, if the study of this phenomenon is to be taken seriously, we've got to come up with a better way to answer these questions. True. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Well, how, we, how do we accomplish that goal? Well, one way we could set up experiments, especially to find out if we can, are producing these ghosts ourselves. Uh, investigate theaters where ghosts have been haunted. Do the characters seen, do they resemble actors or or caricatures in a play? Uh, There's so many other elements that need to be addressed, but I believe setting up experiments, setting up and collecting data and evaluating data is the answer right there. We've got to approach the subject like a science or not. The TV shows out there, very entertaining, but they're just that. TV shows, entertaining. They're not ghost hunting. Well, and and I'm going to share this with you. This is just my personal philosophy. You've got ghost hunting, and then you've got paranormal research and investigation. And I see a difference between the two. Ghost hunting is inter- in in many ways I look at it as entertainment, which is fine. I think it's I think it's done some good for the field in that it's brought it to the forefront. It's made people interested, but it it still is just that 
It's entertainment. Whereas paranormal research is kind of what we're trying to talk about here, and that's coming up with the answers and using the scientific method, using standardized procedures within uh, with, within the entire field. doesn't mean everybody does everything exactly the same, but mm-hmm. the structure is similar. Therefore, the results we get can be compared. Does that make sense? Oh, very much. In fact, I think that ghost hunting has improved. Well, you know, I started this back 30 years ago. Uh, only one attack Americans believe ghosts were possible. Now mm-hmm. the number is what one out of every uh, out of every yeah. three. Right. So there are far more believers, but unfortunately, watching the TV shows, I think they get uh, the wrong impression of no what question. we do. But we don't and do a the, very good job. But we don't do a very good job of marketing our end of it. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I don't. We, we we're not getting the word out there the way we need to to say, hey, this is the reality of what we're trying to to accomplish. Well, we get uh, uh, cut off by the loud noise produced by the demonologist. Uh, oh, that's so. Oh, what's over there? There's always that what I call the gotcha moment in every mm-hmm. one of these TV shows. I see so, over there. Of course, the camera doesn't point there. We have no idea what they were seeing, if anything. So, we are left with a real quandary. Now, there are good people out there doing work. And they do uh, uh, stumble upon and actually find some good stuff, but mm-hmm. they're not approaching it scientifically. Oh, investigations I've done take weeks. You go Absolute. back again and again. The ghost hunters go in for a week, make their show, and then they're off to another state to make another one somewhere right. else. You can't do that. That's not the way research, real research, is done. Uh- and see, my my take on this is that the first part of this foundation that we have to build is training. We, I think, see, I think most people, there's two types of people, in my opinion, that get into the field. Ones that are doing it for the fun of it, and and there's a place for that, I guess. And mm-hmm. then there's folks that have their intentions are right, but they really have no more direction than what they see on the TV. So what yep. we have to do is we have to create a foundation of training and structure to help understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. And that's got to be something we've, we've got to somehow build throughout, throughout the field, in my opinion. I think we need kind of like a clearinghouse where all these divergent groups with all their different philosophies yes. can clear information and uh, kind of share data. That's one of the things Absolutely. I hate about so much of modern ghost hunting is these groups of form ref- Refuse to share their findings with anyone else. Well, they're, like, they're, I've got mine. You go get yours, and, and that's not the way it used to be. And and that's and we're gonna we're working to change that. Now there are there are paranormal uh, repositories out there, but they're very they're, they're they're either not known about or they're very exclusive. We need mm-hmm. to come up with a way that folks can get information and enter information. In law enforcement, we have we have that same type of system where if we have a murder in California, it's sent into, put into the system and cops in New York can, can compare the evidence. That's what we need to do in our field and, and have that information available for the folks that I, need it. I agree with you 100%. That's long overdue. Well, and, and we've got to work hard to get there. I've had a lot of folks tell me, oh, you know, it's tough. you got egos. You've got people with different points of view. And my answer is, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, is nuts to that. Let's make it work. Yes, if it was easy, anybody could do it. If it was easy, it would have been done. Let's move forward, though. Let's not give up. Let's put. Let's let's get this done. And that's that's my view of the whole thing. Until we do that, I don't think we're going to be taken any more seriously than we are right now. Uh, I agree with you again on that, and unfortunately, whatever, if any of these guys making the TV shows get caught cheating, why they tar all of us as cheaters and Monty Banks and stuff like that. So uh, it's it's a really a difficult quest, but I believe that it's the right path, because in essence, this answers so many questions. What is the nature of time? What is the nature of death? Does death really exist? What is there beyond the grave? I mean, these are a lot of 
very serious questions, which were once the uh, preview of the uh, or purview of the priest and the uh, rabbi. Now, so now we're trying to find some scientific evidence that this, in fact, is, is a reality. Well, in this last few seconds here, before we take our final break, what are the chances of us ever? In fact, let's, uh, we're going to go to our break in just a second, but I want you to think about this. We'll talk about it when we get back. What are the chances of us ever being taken seriously by the scientific community? So chew on that a little bit uh, for a few minutes. Richard, folks, stay with us. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes on our final break here. Uh, great conversation with Richard Sennett, uh, website richardsennett.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back in a moment. is under ever-increasing pressure from untenable lifestyles and growing populations. Yet, viable answers seem in short supply. What if I told you there's an ancient form that can empower you to take charge of your life? What if your entire family could be enfolded and supported by life itself, finding safe passage through challenging times? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School with great news, an upcoming series of leading-edge online affordable classes based in an ancient form of shamanism easily learned and used by your entire family. Galactic Shamanism, Art of the Ancients, Key to Tomorrow are a series of online adult and children's lessons instructing your entire family on natural law, how to cooperate with and be supported by the powers of the universe. Visit findyourpathhome.com to find these unique and powerful classes. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. And welcome back to this last segment of tonight's Paranormal Stakeout with my guest, Richard Sennett. Uh, Richard is the author of Ghost Hunters Hall of Fame and Divine Encounters, Stories of Angels and Ghosts. He is one of the old names in paranormal uh, research and investigation. His website is richardsenate.com. I'd also like to invite all of you to go to www.xzbn.net and check out all of the terrific programming that the Exome Broadcast Network has to offer, including Paranormal Stakeout. Uh, please come and visit me at www.paranormalstakeout.com. You can also get a hold of me on my team's website, www.paranormalfbi.com. Uh, Richard, just before that last break, you were on a, a roll with a thought there. Do you want to continue on with that? For uh... Well, yeah, we were talking about will we ever get um, respect from the scientific community. Right. I think we will, but we may not see it in our lifetimes. But only way we're ever going to do it is if we approach it as a science and mm -hmm. go wherever the data takes us. And I believe we will. We will if we apply that kind of uh, methodology to the subject. 
The way we're going now, we're more folklorists than anything mm-hmm. else. We're collecting data and, and kicking theories around and trying different things out. And, uh, but we don't have anything firm to base it upon. Well, I think we will in the long run. And, and I agree with you. Here's the one thought that comes to mind, though. You, and I agree with you. In law enforcement, we do the same thing. Your case goes where the evidence takes you, and it may be exonerating your suspect. In our case, what if what if we follow the leads, we follow the evidence, and we actually determine we're creating our own ghosts? <laughs> what, what kind of backlash do you think we're going to get from the folks that are making lots of money out of it? Well, it's going to be very difficult for them a uh, case an interesting thing i got involved in is is uh, cryptographology mm-hmm. which essentially is books written by dead authors uh and this was very popular back in the early 20th century with ouija boards you know with their books mm-hmm. were supposedly written by mark twain and uh l frank Baum, a number of other people but when i got into it it opened up a lot of possibilities. Could it be that people using a Ouija board attempting to contact, well, Mark Twain or any great writer, somehow in their subconscious mind, they could actually copy his style? And actually, these were not fraudulent works. Perhaps they were, in fact, products of our own subconscious. This could even give us clues to the mental development of man. It could very well be that within it, we have much more than we ever imagined. Mm-hmm. could be producing ghosts. It could be uh, who knows what. Opening up, opening up those mind. new dimensions. Yeah, and opening up those new dimensions. May, you know, they're, they're, it could open up to all kinds of things. We don't even have a clue yet. I get a little concerned when anybody says to me they know exactly what a ghost is. Mm-hmm. Nobody, yeah, so do I. No, nobody knows. But this is the age-old question man has been asking since the dawn of time and Mm -hmm. our goal has got to be to unveil that answer and that's where we're heading but all this all this aside you still believe that there are spirits of the departed that may still be on this earth correct you still yes i do believe that a minority but definitely enough evidence exists to say that Yes, there are spirits of the dead who do seem to come back sometimes to give help and sometimes to uh, just check up on us. So keeping that in mind, uh, kind of getting to the fun side of this a little bit, tell me a little bit about your scariest, most exciting, best investigation. Um, We were, my wife and I were on board the Queen Mary, the ship. And we were there for a a ghost conference. And we were kind of last-minute add-ons, and they gave us this really awful cabin. I believe (laughs) the ship was almost sold out. I don't know who was in that cabin. It certainly wasn't anyone with any money. It was a long, thin corridor with a bed, essentially. And uh, we didn't mind because, well, you know, it came with the... uh, uh, We got a free room with our stay, so Mm -hmm. we, we... Shook, shook our heads, stayed there. Middle of the night, my wife woke me up, and there was a woman stand, sitting at a, at a um, makeup cabinet, a uh, makeup desk there that was built into the wall. And she said, do you see that? And I saw what appeared to be like an outline of a woman. And I, it looked like she was wearing a slip. But as she turned towards us, I could see it was actually a, a old time um night ga- uh, not nightgown but a, a evening dress gotcha and my wife talked to her and uh she asked who are you it was really kind of scary and finally as she said that you're dead you you have, don't have to be here anymore and she uh, vanished so really that was one of the most exciting sightings i've had on board the old Queen Mary, which, by the way, legitimately is haunted. Well, do you, are you familiar with a gentleman named Chris George? He, he with works. A, a gentleman by the name of Chris George. No, I don't. 
Yeah, he he works quite a bit on the Korean War. Uh, tremendous investigator. Had him on the show before. He has done a lot of great work um, on on the Queen Mary. But yeah, definitely hunted. This this particular um, uh, vision that you had of this ghost that you saw. Any question that it was a ghost, or was it? Uh, it couldn't have been something you uh, you concocted out of your brain from the sound of it. Well, first, nothing I would have contacted. <laughs> uh, and it certainly, uh, in fact, that was even, I even, that's another thing I do whenever I have a, an event like this happen. When more than one person sees a ghost, I have them draw a picture of it and see if their recollection in their image is similar to what I saw and what others saw. So that's one technique I use is art mm -hmm. uh, in my uh, findings. We both draw a very similar image image of a woman with short hair and this, a long necklace and this, um, this strange looking evening gown that she was ready and mm -hmm. Debbie who is a gifted psychic uh, said she was going to a party and she met a man on the ship and she died in the second world war and so did he and now uh, they come back here to the one place where they knew some kind of happiness before the conflict ripped them apart mm -hmm. and took their lives. So that was the story that I got from her. But again, you know, how much evidence is there? As an investigator, I'd like to go further and see if we could get a list of names, maybe find out Absolutely. if a person of that name, Trevor, uh, and uh, her name was Laura, if they were on the ship, and if there was any linkage to, oh, the late 1930s. So it's, uh, as an investigator, you're left with this quandary. What in the world did we see? And, and where do you see mediums in this? Kind of getting back to the discussion of, of what all this is. How do you see mediums fitting into this? Here you had a medium that was able to provide some information for you. If we're dealing with dimensions or stuff that we're actually creating out of our own mind – how are mediums getting this information? Probably psychically through some means. Right. I do yeah. not know. But but what um, I'm getting at is they're they're getting information getting information on past humans. But if we're creating this ourselves, kind of going back to that theory we had a couple minutes ago, just just throwing that out there, just an, another interesting curveball to this, if you if you will. Well, in fact, I say there there are many ways to to get to the truth. And there are metaphysical ways, which use mediumship to kind of like Hans Holtz who did. Right. Or there are very scientific ways that one can use. But they're all paths to the same uh, End place. Game. We're yep. all trying to go to the, find the answers. And, and, and I, I think I did an experiment. Yeah. Do we have a few minutes? We've got uh, just about two and a half. Go ahead. Okay, well, I did an experiment in a haunted hotel here in, in my home uh, area uh, in Santa Paula. In fact, it's called the Glen Tavern Inn. It's been on ghost shows before. Uh -huh. I got two groups of people. One, all scientific people. They just use equipment. They were very much scientists. And another group, all metaphysicians. There were mediums, pendulum swingers, Ouija boards, <laughs> the whole bit. You know, They were on that end the other end, I had them both come to the place, and the idea was to see which one gained the most information. Oh, I love it. That's a and, great idea. And I had the one group come, uh, and the, uh, the uh, people with all the, the equipment, they got there early with their bag suitcases full of stuff, and what? then finally the, the, the psychic people, they were late. They stumbled in about 10 minutes later, and the head lady, Madam, I forget her name, uh, she said, what are those geeks doing here? <laughs> I said, well, they're part of this whole thing, you know. And then I went over to the head of the other team, and I said, what are those freaks doing here? So I had names for them, the geeks versus the freaks. Uh -huh. And oddly enough, they all went into the hotel, and I divided them. Each one had a, a floor of their own to investigate. But they started to uh, filter down and interact with one another. And it was really amazing because they... These are people who have a totally different philosophy, but a psychic lady would go, I'm feeling something right here. And then the, the one of the 
technicians that come and said, yeah, I'm getting, re getting a reading and, right here. And, I, and, and so, Richard, I hate to do this to you, my friend, but we're at the end of our time. Oh, so, well, it, but it worked out. So I found blending the two ideas worked real well. Okay. Well, Richard, I wish we had more time. I'm going to get you back on the show because we've got a lot more to talk about. Paranormal unity, research, standardization, that's where you got to go. Join me. Mm -hmm. Join me on this journey, Richard, and everybody out there. Get with me on www.paranormalstakeout.com, folks. Let me know what you think. Richard Sennett, thank you for being with us tonight. And listeners and all my friends and family out there, thank you for being with us. Happy Thanksgiving. See you on the other side.